Hello and welcome to the Wedding Dish Podcast. Grab your fork and knife and take a seat at our table as we dish on all things weddings. You'll hear stories and tips from real couples and wedding pros about love, life, and entrepreneurship. I am Sarah Alpin. I am the host of The Wedding Dish, and I am the CEO of Photos from the Hardy and District Bliss. Sadly, today, our little French bulldog, Bud Clouseau, is downstairs eating his dinner and not in his podcasting chair, so you won't hear him snoring the loudest snores ever today. Um, <laughs> but I have an amazing guest, so I don't think you'll miss him too much. Don't worry. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into The Wedding Dish. I am so excited to be dishing today with today's guest. So today, I am joined by a premier mobile bartending vendor with delicious grazing tables and an exceptional staff based in the D.C. area. I have with me the human being behind On The Fly Tabsters, Jennifer Cummings. Thank you so much for being on The Wedding Dish with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and to I like to talk everything bar. It's it's my passion. I'm really excited to learn about some of this because even though I've been in the wedding industry since 2005, when I was building out my questions, I realized that there were some things that I had ever never actually thought about other than like I didn't have the options to think about them at my wedding. So it's I'm I'm excited to hear some things. So, are you ready to dish? Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about bartending and drink services. So dry for hire versus alcohol included. First of all, what does that mean? Okay. Well, often those two are misunderstood. When people hear dry hire, they're thinking, wait, no, I want alcohol. So does that mean there's going to be no alcohol? And that is not what it means. What it means is that I will not be, the bartender will not be supplying the alcohol. The client will be supplying the alcohol. And then we'll be supplying the, um, the menu, the mixers, the cups, the napkins, the bartender, the bar, everything, the garnishes, everything that goes along that's required for a bar. And then the client provides the alcohol. So often that is, that's, that seems scary to the client. They think, well, what am I paying for if I'm providing the alcohol? And, but the alcohol is, I would say, not the part that makes the bar. So it's the, it's the mixers, it's the talent behind it, it's the bartender. So with, without that, you're not going to have your bar experience. So, and then often it's scary for clients because they think, wait, so what am I paying you for if you're not providing the alcohol? So, and they think I'm going to have to buy the alcohol separate and they think, well, it's going to be more. Well, actually a dry hire bar is actually more economically friendly than an alcohol bar. Because if we provide the alcohol, which we can, we can do um, in certain locations. In Virginia, we are strictly a dry hire. In in D.C., we have our liquor license. It made sense for us to get it in D.C. for our clients. However, in Virginia, it makes more sense for us to serve as a dry hire. We provide a shopping list for our clients and they will, we, we send them to our preferred vendor and they call in their order with that shopping list and they pay for it as a separate transaction. And then we go and we pick up the alcohol for them and we deliver it to their event. And if there's kegs, we also take care of the keg deposits, the lifting, and then also the return of those kegs. So, and it's economically, it makes sense for our clients because it is actually cheaper as opposed to paying your caterer for the alcohol to pay retail for the alcohol as opposed to our per head fee that we would charge. Um, now, if you're wanting one bill and price is not important to you, then I would say that an all-inclusive with the alcohol would make sense where you just have one bill. You don't worry about it. You don't have to talk to anybody else. The pricing is a little higher uh, for the alcohol included, but you're paying for that. You're paying for that ease. Um, with that. And the reason why it is more expensive is because our our expenses, insurance, the the licensing, 
uh, everything we and then of course we have to go purchase it and then we have to charge an upcharge on it and everything so um so it is it is a little bit more you know to have an alcohol inclusive bar but uh for those who um, want that convenience that's absolutely available in our dc location and then in virginia uh we are a dry hire so we only have dry hire service there and in maryland as well but we take care of all those details for you you just it's just two separate purchases and it actually is very economically friendly if that is a concern for you for a budget wedding that's so interesting because I mean, it, it all makes sense, but initially, if I if you weren't providing me with the list, I would be like, oh my God, how am I supposed to know how much to get and what to get? And I don't even know what people drink in cocktails <laughs> and things. Yes, we take, so, care, we take care of all of that. Yeah, that makes it so much easier. So you immediately overcame the initial barrier that I had, and that just makes it so much easier. And then it actually – kind of feels fun because you can make the decisions like, okay, if I'm going to need this amount of beer and like, oh, well, do I want to go with a craft beer? Do I want to go with like a mix of beers? Then I I think that could be actually very fun to like plan too. Absolutely. Yes. And our vendors have a very large selection. So they are able to choose exactly what they want and, um, and they know exactly the amounts that they need. And then for the signature cocktails, we let them know, you know, exactly what they're going to need for those as well. And then they have a little bit more room to play around with some of the other alcohols that they might want to include or, you know, like you said, the beer choices and, and everything. So. Oh, interesting. Okay. So it, that's fascinating. Okay. So talking about budget and how the bar can kind of impact budget. What are some of the reasons that couples might choose a cash bar versus an open bar? Okay. Well, an open bar is where all the drinks are provided. So you pay ahead of time um, and you pay uh, a per head fee usually, and it provides an average of one drink per hour for the event. So if you have a four hour event, then that's four drinks per person on average. Some people will drink a little less, some will drink a little more. We usually bring about 10% extra so that we cover all of that. So you're, you're not paying for too much, but you won't run out either. So, so that's the, the concept of an open bar. That's probably your most expensive option. And then we have the cash bar. And that's where uh, our clients will pay at the bar for their own drinks. Now, that's only available in our D.C. location. And in Virginia, where where if the mobile bar is a dry hire, they're not allowed to have a cash bar. So if if you're hiring somebody for a um, dry hire bar, you won't be able to have a cash bar. But if you're hiring alcohol in inclusive, then you can have a cash bar. And however, I will say that that's not the most popular. It's I the most hate them as a guest. <laughs> yes, it's it's the most economically friendly because your guests are paying for it, but they may not be very happy with you. <laughs> so there is a, there is a compromise for that, though. So you can have a open bar for beer and wine, and then have your liquor as as a cash bar. You can also have a um, limited bar where you only have, you know, two drinks per person that's provided. And then after that, if they want more, they can purchase more. So there's there's all kinds of combinations that you can do as well um, so that you have it, so it meets your budget. And then you also have happy guests as well, which is super important. So in the bar, I mean, the bar is the life of the party. So you want to, you definitely want to get the bar part right. You don't want to skimp on that part. So I tend to agree. Um, <laughs> I feel a little bit bad that I said I hate cash bars. I don't hate them. But when I was going to a lot of things that had cash bars, you actually mm -hmm. had to have cash cash. Oh, yes. So I, those days are probably gone. Um, <laughs> and you can swipe a card yeah, now. Electronic. Yes. Yes, yes. But I never had cash on me. So I would always be like borrowing cash from friends. And it was embarrassing. Mm -hmm. 
that t- shows you my age a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm no spring chicken as well. So, yes, I agree with that. It's all about personality anyway. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So in terms of cash bar versus open bar, uh, or let me back up here. Okay. So you mentioned limited, full, and cash combo. You kind of walked through those a little bit. How do you know which one is the right fit for you? And do you factor in kind of like what your guest's overall experience is? Like if you're, you know, don't, if your guests are not big drinkers, is there anything that, what are your thoughts on this? Yes. Absolutely. You need to know your guests. So more than likely, if you, you will know your guests the best. So I would say definitely um, meeting those needs. If you know that your guests are not going to be heavy drinkers, then a limited bar makes sense in, you know, or just have a bar open for a couple hours or, or limit the drinks and, uh, or having just beer and wine and one cocktail or two cocktails, you know, the two signature cocktails. And so that makes sense. And we do a lot of that. I would say that the full bar where you have every option under the sun, if you can walk into the bar and order it, you can, you know, that, that, that's the, that's the full bar. So that's where you come with all the garnishes, everything that's, uh, we've had that a couple of times, but it's not, it's not the most popular. And uh, so I would definitely say middle of the road, you know, a couple of wine choices, a couple of beer choices, and then a cocktail or two. You mentioned signature cocktails. What does that mean? Okay. Signature cocktails are the highlight of the event and they should reflect the the partners, you know, the the couple's um, choices, their personality, their likes, and often we'll name them fun names uh, that reflect the, our clients' um, personalities. And we'll create a a menu with those on there. And they're usually the most popular drinks at the event. I will say that. So they, they go fast. And so they're fun to have. And they're just another way to um, personalize the bar. And also it's a way to say thank you to your guests for coming. And so um, it's just, I would definitely say that it's, um, if you can do it, it's definitely something you should include in your bar because it definitely personalizes it. I like the idea that it personalizes it and that, you know, you can, you can either reflect potentially the area or your favorite drink or something that has to do with where you met or where you, you know, where the wedding is versus where you live. Or I I think I've seen couples do like ones that are named after their animals too when they're animals. Yes, we've had that too. Yes, I was about to say that. Yes, they're pets. Absolutely. We've had that. And with the, they'll often will have their, pets images on on the menu. So it's really cute. I love that. That's so fun. It's just an, it sounds like a, yeah. Yeah. Travel themes. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Mine, mine would probably be an Aperol spritz, I think. Yes. (laughs) And we can also do something completely new or something that has meaning to you, or we can take something that has meaning to you and tweak it a little bit just for that day. So to make it unique and different. So oh, fun. We mules, yeah, we can make mules all different ways. And we can make uh, pretty much any of your, your classic cocktails. We can tweak it and make it personalized for your event. I love that. I know that I didn't prep you for this question, but out of curiosity – is the gin Ricky the official drink of DC? I seem to remember that from something. Gin Do you Ricky. No. I don't know that one. I need to look that one up. I'm sorry. I need to look that up. So, Do you know what the official drink is of DC? I don't. Oh my goodness. Now you've you've got me 
curious. I need to look that up. I should know that. Thank you for letting me know. I'm going to look that up. I'm and so curious. That's it's. I'm. I feel like the drink of DC is brunch. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Mimosas, and you better get the orange juice just right because if you. <laughs> so yeah. I love it. I love it so much. Oh, <clears throat> actually, I just got word from Nathan next to me, and it is the Ricky, the official yes. drink of DC. You have it right. Absolutely. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Nathan for the win. <laughs> yes. So we have our answer. <laughs> so. We have our own behind the scenes Googler on this episode. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so. I love it so much. By the way, for all of you out there listening, it happens to be someone's anniversary today. Yes. Yes, 19 years. So um, it goes by. That's amazing. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. And you're taking the time to do this. I couldn't believe when you were like, I'm in a hotel celebrating my anniversary. I was like, (laughs) oh my gosh, you're taking the time to do this at five o'clock on a Friday. (laughs) It's it's okay. Yes, I I enjoy it. So I love it, it. it. I can reminisce as well. So it talking weddings, it's it's nice. So that's amazing. Where did you two get married in the DC area out of curiosity? Actually, no. So uh my husband's originally from San Diego and I'm originally from Northern California, but I have moved to San Diego and I met him and we got married there in San Diego. So um we actually met and then we got engaged and we were actually married the next weekend after we got engaged. So. <laughs> so wow. Uh, yeah. So we had a lot of people thinking, wow, what are you doing, Jennifer? You're crazy. This isn't going to last. <laughs> but here we are 19 years later. And we we had a wedding and everything planned in a week. I didn't think that could happen. We, we, were, we were going to go and just have a courthouse wedding. We weren't going to do that to our family because we knew we were, you know, throwing it on them. But they wouldn't have it. So they planned us a wedding in a week. So we, That's I had every – That's incredible. Everything. Yes. I even had a wedding dress. And so – and my bridesmaids, they had dresses. We weren't able to get them altered or anything. So some of them were kind of tripping on them down the aisle. But we we literally had everything. It was a surprise wedding. All I picked out was the colors. And I didn't know what it was going to look like when I showed up. And I showed up and it was like – you know, and honestly, I'm kind of glad that it happened that way. I had the wedding in my dreams, but none of the stress because somebody else did it for me. So That's incredible. <laughs> I am going to have to have you come back on the wedding dish to talk about your wedding if you are willing to and interested because Absolutely. that is incredible. What a unique story. And, you know, to have your family all rally around you too and, and care enough that you had this celebration that, you know, they wanted – for the two of you. That's so cool. Yes. Yes. And if you look at your, if you look at our wedding pictures, you can't tell it was planned in a week. And I was like, it doesn't take a year to plan a wedding. And this was a whole lot of, you know, less stress. So (laughs) it was great. I mean, I guess it can't happen for everybody, but you know, it was, it was, it was awesome. So, and here we are 19 years later, so it must've worked. So (laughs) that's amazing. Oh my gosh. (laughs) <laughs> wow. I cannot wait to hear more about this in the future. We're <laughs> definitely going to have to talk about that. I absolutely love it. And now I have 10,000 questions. Get yourself back on track. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I kind of want to talk to you about, you know, right now we're seeing a lot of couples who are really – care they care about being environmentally conscious you know that's a huge shift that we've seen in the wedding industry and they want to factor in their carbon footprint on their actual wedding day yes the bar is probably the most waste producing aspect of any event so how does on the fly tapsters create an environmentally friendly bar experience Absolutely. So yes, the bar is absolutely the most wasteful. You have all your cups, your napkins, your straws, 
all of that and it all gets tossed in the trash. So how do we deal with that? I did a little research on it. Um, before I was a mobile bartender, I was a chemist. So all of that totally like interests me and, and I have to read up on everything before I, you know, just buy into something. So I was looking into the bioplastics, the compostable cups and everything. And I thought, well, that's the way I'll go. So, and you know, and that's the, the, all the rage right now and, um, you know, to compost and to recycle and reuse. So I thought that that's what I would do. And so I started looking into them and what I found out shocked me. And so the bioplastics, which if you think about the term bioplastic, what does that mean? Like it makes you think, okay, it's, it, you know, comes from the earth. It's, it's safe. And, but bioplastic, so where does plastic come from? It comes from fossil fuels, which fossils, I mean, that, I mean, that was originally life form too. So technically that's bioplastic as well. So these terms can really, you know, kind of play with us a little and they think that we're doing something so green. So most bioplastics that we use is uh, PLA, which means polylactic acid, and it's made from corn. So that sounds safe, doesn't it? Sounds like that'll just go right back to the earth. Yeah. But once it goes through the chemical process that it goes through, it creates a polymer, like all plastics, and it it's supposed to be biodegradable. But studies have shown that it's not as biodegradable as we would like to believe. So it might biodegrade if it's thrown in a landfill and, or it might not, it might stay there. But if it does biodegrade and it's in an anaerobic environment, meaning no oxygen, then it's going to, as it breaks down, it's gonna produce methane gas, which is 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It's a greenhouse gas. So that's terrible for the environment. So. The next step is like, well, what if we throw it in a recycling bin? Because that's usually where they're going to throw those cups is in a recycling bin. But if you throw it in a recycling bin, you just contaminated that recycling bin because they can't be recycled. Only the plastics can be recycled. So if you throw a bio cup into a recycling bin, that whole recycling bin is more than likely going to show up in the landfill because now they can't recycle it. So, yes. And then the only other option when you have compostable cups is to send it to a commercial composting facility because you can't just throw it out in your yard or in your own composting bin because it's not going to break down. So you have to send it to a commercial composting bin. So it has to be separated out from regular trash and has to be separated out from recycling. How many venues do you know do that? Separate it out. Oh, Probably zero. Zero. And how many commercial composting facilities do you know of that you can take these to? And not very many and not all of them except the compostable cups because the chemical process that they go through converts them to, to a form that's not, it, it won't produce the nutrient rich soil that they're looking for. So it's not really good for the soil either. So yeah, that was going to be my next question. Interesting. Yeah. And there, because you, and a lot of people think, oh, compostable, like we can just throw it in the garden or we'll just, you know, if it lands in landfill, it won't hurt. Or if it, you know, or we can recycle it. And that's not the case. You can't really do any of those with it. So in that sense, like if you are into recycling, then the recyclable plastic actually makes more sense because at least you know, there's, you can have a recycle bin and you can throw them in there and you know, those are going to get recycled. The compostable ones, they're not necessarily going to get sent to a composting facility. And then if they go to the landfill, they might not break down. And then if they do, they could be producing methane gas. So it's not the most environmentally friendly and they are more expensive. So if you're trying to be on a budget, then the composting um, cups and straws are not the way to go. So if you're wanting to be environmentally friendly, reduce and reuse are the words that you need to remember. So reuse, rent glasses. You can rent glassware and you can rent ac acrylic ware. 
And that's actually probably more budget friendly than the composting cups and everything. So I would totally recommend using, you know, the glassware or our acrylic ware if you don't want glassware. And then for like, forgo the straw, we can, you know, you can get stir sticks that are, you know, like made from wood or uh, lots of different options. I know a lot of people don't like the paper straws. Some people are okay with them, but you know, a lot of people are going to the PLA straws because they think, oh, these are compostable and they don't, you know, melt in your mouth. <laughs> so, uh, but they're not, they're not environmentally friendly. So either totally do away with the straw completely, uh, get some wooden stir sticks, something like that, and then um, re reusable cups. So that, that's how you have a um, bio-friendly uh, wedding. That's so fascinating. So I know this is a little bit outside of your jurisdiction per se, but the little compostable plastic bags they give you to use in your compost container, are they the same? I don't – so those – I don't believe those are. And the, the really thin okay. ones that you can get yeah. like at moth and stuff, I would have to look into those. I haven't looked at what those are made out of. But if they're made to go in your composting bin, then those are different than those okay. harder plastics. So those are more than likely going to break down. Now, if you read on it and it says that you need to send it to a composting facility, then, then no, they're not they're not environmentally friendly. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So then that's what we should be looking for. I feel like those melt when I put like after the coffee felt the coffee is sat in them for a couple of days, the coffee grounds. So I'm guessing they actually break down now that I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So yes, they probably do then. If they're made to go into your composting bin, then those will actually break down. So those are different. So you definitely don't want that's to be so in interesting. Those. Yes. That's so and interesting. And if you want the plastic, like we, the plastics, the plastic cups that we do use for those who want the plastic cups, um, they are recyclable. So you can have a recycling bin there and you can have them tossed in there and we can, you know, put a sign on there. So that's, you know, another thing that you can do if you're not wanting to rent glasses. So I would definitely do that over the composting because that's not, it's not going to get to the com commercial composting. Um, yeah. Way. I would imagine <laughs> that if it's going to get there, then there's going to be some sort of upcharge. And also you'd have to have like a separate bin for it. It feels like yes. it starts to get very complicated very quickly for people. And most people aren't going to throw it away in the right trash can. So, <laughs> Yeah, that too. <laughs> How fascinating. Okay. That's so good to know. I hadn't really, I mean, I had no idea. And I feel like I see those at breweries and stuff now all the time oh, too. Yeah. That it's super popular and you, you feel like you're doing something great for the environment, but you're really not. <laughs> so That's so interesting. I'm open mouth staring. I just became aware. <laughs> That's how I was because I was like, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna have the compostable cups and straws. This is going to be great. And then I looked into it and I was like, oh, I've been deceived. No. <laughs> so, oh, that's yeah. so disappointing. I guess paper would be the better option than yes. those then too. Yeah. But again, then you run into people throwing them in the wrong container if it's recycling potentially. It sounds like renting acrylic cups would be – the way to go if you yes. really w are worried about your environmental, you know, impact of your wedding day. Yes. That's absolutely what I recommend. So I have learned and then if people so rent much our, on Yes. In our tap bus where we uh, pour from the taps. Um, so we do have events where it's just pouring from the taps. So if you're going to have an event like that, we've had, um, we've had clients that have uh, provided their own reusable cups um, or brought their own, like everyone brought their own special mug or whatever. And so um, that's, we, we've done that several times. So that, that's another option. That's also kind of cool. Yes. And for photo purposes, that could be very interesting as well. Yes, 
absolutely more of an eclectic so um but it's it, it can be fun we, we've seen that a few times I know I didn't tee you up for this question either, but this one's not a hardball one, I swear. Okay. Speaking of pouring from the taps and all of these things, we have not actually addressed what your bar can look like and be. So what makes your bar so photographically interesting and different? Yes. Okay. Well, we have a vintage, a 1962 vintage VW bus that has six taps on it. It's the only one in the DMV area. Um, her name is Norma Jean. And she's <laughs> super cute. Yes. And she has a 55 inch screen TV that pops out of the top so that you can display your um, slideshow or video or you can stream, um, we can stream anything. So, um, so it's pretty neat. And she's, uh, she's got six taps, so we can tap, we can tap alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks. We can even tap uh, cocktails as well. And we have um, nitrogen on board as well. So we can do nitro brew. We can also, um, it's starting to become more popular to, to have, to, uh, add nitrogen to cocktails as well. So if you're into oh. that, you want kind of a different experience. So it makes it, so unlike CO2, it creates a, it does create a foam, but it creates little tiny, tiny micro bubbles, which are, uh, it creates a very smooth feel to the drink. And that's why everyone likes nitro brew coffee. It's because of that smoothness that's, that it imparts to it. So um, the nitrogen imparts that smoothness and kind of a, a different experience. How cool. I have learned so much about science on this episode <laughs> of The Wedding Dish. Yes. So I think that's why I fell in love with it because I, I love chemistry, but I'm also an artist. So bartending just made sense because you're mixing stuff, but you have the artistic flair of it as well. So that's incredible. I, I love that you've taken all of the things you've loved and created them into this super fun, like, bar experience. I mean, it's truly an experience. It's not just bartending. It's not, you know, you're bringing Norma Jean. <laughs> yes. It's great for photos. You and can get in here. She's stunning. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love it so much. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much for being here with me on The Wedding Dish today, for sharing your expertise, for helping all of us understand the ins and outs of bar and all of the things that went into it, including the chemistry behind compostables. Crazy. Where can our listeners find you online? Well, they can find us online at www.onthefly.tapsters.com or they can find us on Instagram as well and Facebook. We also have another brand, Combi Keg RVA. And so that is kind of revolves strictly around our van. So you can find that as well on Instagram, Combi Keg at Combi Keg RVA. And then we also have a website, Combi Keg RVA.com. So that's where they can, they can find us. So Amazing. Well, everyone, make sure you probably have your phone in your hand or somewhere next to you. Make sure you follow on Instagram. And while you're there, you can follow at The Wedding Dish Podcast, and you'll be able to get all the links and insights and everything on the theweddingdishpodcast.com. Our show notes will be there. And of course, we will link out to to on the fly chaps on the fly tapsters listen to me having friday you know tripping over myself um in the episode description and everything and if you would like to see jennifer and the on the tapsters crew live in real life you can join us at our couple social on january 22nd 2023 at mess hall in dc they are based out of mess hall which is an incubator kitchen that transforms into an amazing event space. It's so cool. And just the loveliest humans. It's going to be such a fun event. I'm really excited to try some of your cocktails and your grazing table, everything. It's going to be so much fun. I'm so thrilled to have you joining us at that event. 
we are excited as well. And we're going to have some drinks on nitrogen as well. So you can experience Ooh. that. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. The link is on the website at theweddingdishpodcast.com. It's also in the episode description here. So grab your free ticket and come celebrate your engagement with us and you'll get to meet Jennifer in real life. I look forward to it. Thank you Amazing. All right. Yes. Thank you for being here with me on The Wedding Dish. Everybody out there, tune in next week and follow, rate, and review on your favorite podcasting app. Until next time, cheers. Thank you.